So now we're going to see how uh, we can apply the systems approach for managing Phytophthora, emphasizing the role of water in particular. Well, the first step in this process is to analyze your nursery or greenhouse site for the risk of contamination by Phytophthora. You want to make a flow chart and uh, complete the checklists that are in the manual and identify key points of vulnerability or or critical control points for contamination. And finally, you'll then uh, choose best management practices that address each of the critical control points. So here's an example of a flowchart for a nursery operation. You'll want to make one for your own production system. This one's been broken down into uh, potting media and containers, plants, pest and disease management, and water. But of course, water really is involved in many aspects uh, in the nursery, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So when thinking about uh, your nursery, you'll want to consider these components, uh, the site selection, preparation, and maintenance of the site, the source of your water, your water treatment method, and uh, water management, uh, plant procurement, where you obtain your plants, propagation, uh, greenhouses, field production areas, your potting media and containers, container yards, uh, placement of your cull piles, uh, staff training, scouting, biosecurity, and record keeping. So the manual contains questions and checklists about each of these components to help you figure out key points of vulnerability. So let's pretend now that we're taking a walk through your... But first, here's the disease triangle again from last week. Keep in mind that what we're trying to do is prevent the convergence of the susceptible host plant, a virulent pathogen, and the conducive environment which in the case of Phytophthora generally means lots of water. So let's start with site selection. There are several considerations, but today I'm just going to address those that deal with water. So is your site well drained? And are your roads paved, graveled, or rocked? Here's a nursery with good slope to facilitate drainage, and there's a nice layer of rock. And this container also has a good slope. Um, even though road, the road is not paved, it does have rock. And notice that it is also very clean with no plant debris on the ground. Now, in contrast to that, here's a nursery with a very muddy road right, running right through it. And every time a vehicle comes along, water is splashed from this big puddle up onto the, up onto the plants. And to make matters worse, this puddle is right next to the coal pile over there on the right, so that pathogens could spread from the debris directly into the puddle. Uh, this nursery was found to be infested with Phytophthora remorum, and it was subsequently uh, prevented from shipping host plants because the sanitation was so poor and their water management was also very poor. Let's think about the water source now. If you have a source of water that is free of pathogens, such as well water or a municipal water source, well, that's good. But if your water is from a surface source, such as a river or pond, uh, you'll need to disinfest it with an approved method. And uh, also, do you recapture runoff water and treat it before using it for irrigation? You can assume that any surface water like this stream is contaminated with Phytophthora. Water can be tested, but it's expensive, and uh, that's because it generally involves baiting and culturing in the lab. So at the end of my talk, I'll give you a couple of um, phone numbers and addresses and emails of some labs that could test your water for you. Many nurseries recapture their runoff water, and they hold it in a retention pond before using it for irrigation. 
So it's especially important to disinfest this recycled water because it tends to accumulate phytophthora. Remember all those species we found in our uh, irrigation water. Here's a water reservoir uh, holding recycled water. The water is first filtered and then treated, in this case, with chlorine gas to disinfest it before using the water for irrigation. And this table shows several different methods for disinfesting water. Uh, over on the left is the, is the type of treatment and uh, with further details about the way the treatment is applied and the usual concentration and so on. Um, this document is available in the manual, in the grower manual that uh, um, I mentioned before. And you can also find further details about water treatment methods at the Water Education Alliance for Horticulture website. And I'll show you that in a moment. This page describes um, several oxidants, such as bromine, chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite, calcium hypochlorite, chlorine dioxide, ozone, and activated peroxygen. On the second page are some other water treatment methods, including UV radiation, copper ionization, heat treatment, and slow sand filtration. So no one method is right for all growers. It depends on the size of your nursery, your uh, water, uh, the water volume you need to treat, um, upfront costs versus maintenance costs. Um, Paul Fisher will probably be addressing uh, more details about water treatment methods in one of these other webinars. So here is the page. Um, at the Water Education Alliance for Horticulture website where you can learn more details about these different water treatment technologies. And you can click on any one of these uh, items such as chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite, find out uh, what you need to know about these different technologies. Let's move on to potting media and containers. Do you store your potting media in an area that's free of puddles or mud. Again, I'm just uh, emphasizing the items that relate to water management. Well, this is important because clean potting media can easily become contaminated with Phytophthora if it's being splashed by contaminated water, especially if there are vehicles uh, that drive through the puddles, uh, especially vehicles that have been used in field operations. OK, what about greenhouses? Do you make sure that containers are only placed on clean, well-draining surfaces to prevent splash contamination? And do you make sure that leafy debris is not allowed to build up on the greenhouse floor? All right, here's a greenhouse where uh, they have a nice little arch uh, uh, to promote good drainage. And note the absence of leafy debris. And think how easy this will be to clean between crops as well. Here's another very clean greenhouse where there's little opportunity for contamination from soil uh, or water splash onto the plants. And here's another example. OK, now in this hoop house, um, they do not have a cement floor, but they have a rock floor. And the containers are raised up above the floor um, just by being placed on, on a layer of other flats. So here's another way to prevent splash dispersal of inoculant from soil onto the plants. And in contrast, this uh, situation again, where the mud has, um, or the, the, the rock has sunk into the mud, preventing good drainage, and Phytophthora is splashed from the puddles onto the plants, causing root rot and foliar blight on these Pieras plants. Let's think about container yards. Is there a barrier between the soil and your containers to prevent splash dispersal? Do you prevent containers from tipping over? 
you make sure that runoff water does not flow through your production areas? And do you remove leafy debris between crops? This nursery has done a nice job of engineering the soil surface uh, for good drainage, uh, and then they covered it with a mesh fabric to make it a little easier to clean. And this nursery created a space for water to flow away from container plants. Here's good use of fabric mesh over rock to promote uh, good drainage and uh, also make it easier to clean up the leafy debris between crops. This fabric easily becomes plugged though and got to got to make sure that this stays clean. Here is uh, a situation where the mesh has gotten clogged with leafy debris and soil and it lo no longer drains well. So these puddles create ideal opportunities for Phytophthora. And here's another bad situation with standing water. Here's some rhododendrons that are practically swimming. Uh, hydroponic rhododendrons. You can imagine how Phytophthora thrives in this environment, easily moving from plant to plant, spreading disease. And these are some rhododendrons that were in containers close to a road where mud was splashed up onto the leaves. And you can see um, little muddy spots on the leaves. And if you look closely in the center, you'll see where uh, a couple of plants are beginning to develop foliar blight from inoculum that was contained in this, uh, in this muddy water. And this slide shows the buildup of, of leafy debris that we sometimes see. In this case, it's calmia plants. And the leaves are infested with Phytophthora. And every time it rains or whenever this area is irrigated, inoculum is splashed up onto the plants. The debris uh, eventually decomposes. And that the spores in those leaves infiltrate the soil and lead to infections current infections year after year. Very hard to clean up once the spores are down, actually down in the soil. I mentioned the problem of plants tipping over. Kurt Huynhuyn in Belgium uh, conducted some experiments with rhododendrons to see how long it would take plants to become infected if they tipped over into water that uh, contained uh, Phytophthora zoospores. In this case, it's Phytophthora remorum. And over on the left are some plants uh, tipped over uh, into this contaminated water. And along the bottom, you can see the different uh, the results for the different timings. And uh, it only took a 10-second dip in infested water for the plants uh, to become infected and develop foliar blight. So you really need to keep your plants from tipping over, especially if there is water um, uh, that, is, uh, that is pooling on the surface. And certainly plants in nurseries are often tipped over, either by wind or during the repotting operation. But you really want to try to avoid this as much as possible. Here's a nice solution for keeping plants upright so they won't tip over. Let's talk about water management. Do you uh, irrigate in such a way to, uh, that you avoid overwatering and keep leaf wetness to a minimum? But Tata requires one to four hours of continuous wetness for spores to infect leaves. Do you irrigate plants that are highly susceptible to Phytophthora with drip or microspray irrigation? Again, this is going to uh, help with reducing the period that leaves are wet. Do you group plants with similar water needs together? And do you prevent water from contaminating waterways? There are some different uh, examples of irrigation methods used in greenhouses. On the, on the top, sub-irrigation, and on the bottom right, overhead irrigation. In the field situation, overhead spray, or in the upper right, microspray. 
So the timing and the amount of irrigation can have a tremendous effect on Phytophthora species. I mentioned the problem of runoff contaminating waterways. Um, these next couple of slides are from Gary Chastagner. Um, and they're photos from a nursery in Washington state where Phytophthora remorum contaminated the runoff water and then contaminated a stream uh, near the nursery. So you can see the runoff uh, here. Uh, on the, and then this is an aerial view of the nursery. And it shows the locations where Phytophthora remorum was detected in the stream and um, in some water baits. So imagine how difficult it would be to clean up a contaminated waterway. And think about those people downstream who might want to use this uh, water for irrigation. Unfortunately, it's contaminated with a quarantine pathogen. Field production. There are some considerations having to do with water and uh, sanitation in the field. Are your soils well drained and level? Does your nursery refill the holes left by removed plants so they don't uh, become filled with water? Does your nursery remove any infested plants and leafy debris? And do you regularly scout low spots in the field where Phytophthora is most likely to be a problem? Here are some photos of Phytophthora infected plants in field situations. In the upper right are some uh, fir trees with root rot, and in the lower left, calmia with symptoms of leaf blight, where inoculum from leafy debris on the soil has splashed onto these lower leaves, turning them brown. Here's a low spot in the field where water has accumulated, and these boxwood plants have root rot caused by Phytophthora cinnamomi, and we know that because we isolated that species from the, from the rotting roots. The plants in the well-drained part of the field are not, uh, are not infected. Again, think of that disease triangle. We've got inoculum, and we've got conducive environment, and we've got a susceptible host. Therefore, we have disease. Now that you've identified uh, some of the key points of vulnerability in your nursery, uh, your critical control points for Phytophthora, you'll be able to come up with some meaningful best management practices. And um, there are lots of options for best management practices provided in the manual. So I want to reiterate that when you implement a systems approach, you're really correcting unsafe practices and preventing disease from occurring in the first place. Um, while identifying critical control points and, and implementing DMPs is voluntary, uh, it's possible that this could be coupled with an auditing and certification system, as has been done in Australia with their Biosecure HACCP program. Well, there are several advantages to growers for participating in a systems approach, economic uh, advantages, reduced risk, and greater flexibility. Um, by complying with these safe practices, growers can uh, provide assurance to their customers that their plants are free of pathogens and pests. And so that gives them greater access to markets, both interstate and international. Um, and a good example of this is the Pelargonium Clean Stock Program. Secondly, growers reduce their risk of contamination uh, by quarantine pests and pathogens, which could result in economic hardships um, because of loss of market and crop destruction and so on. And third, participating in a systems approach could provide growers with greater convenience and flexibility. And that's because they might be able to issue their own phytosanitary certificates. This has been the case with nurseries participating in the US NCP pilot program. Um, if you would like to learn more about, the, about phytophthora diseases and their management, 
I encourage you to go to this Phytophthora online course, Training for Nursery Growers, uh, on the web. Uh, you can access this at no cost, and there are modules on pathogen biology and disease management and Phytophthora vermorum specifically. So thank you very much, and um, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, there was a question about testing irrigation water for Phytophthora. And I mentioned that this is quite expensive. Fifty to a hundred dollars uh, or more per sample. There are a number of labs that do this testing either by filtering water or by testing a leaf bait that has been placed in the water and then culturing uh, what comes out, what grows out of that leaf bait. Uh, it would be a good idea to contact the plant clinic at your land grant university if you want further information about this. I've listed the uh, contact information for Oregon State University uh, and also the University of Massachusetts. There are some ELISA-based field kits um, that are available at fairly low cost, but um, these are not really designed for testing water baits. Uh, there is also some cross-reactivity between Phytophthora species and Pythium spe species, but I have listed these uh, some sources of these ELISA-based field diagnostic kits here. Uh, it might be useful um, if, you're, if you're wondering if your water treatment method has been affected. You might see if uh, the ELISA kits detect Phytophthora species either before or after treatment. Um, it won't tell you what species is present, but it will tell you if Phytophthora is present or not. So you could possibly use these field kits for that purpose. Let me uh, answer a couple of the questions that were emailed during the presentation. One question was, in fast-growing plants, um, how long might it take to see symptoms, for example, annual plants, if uh, contaminated water is used? And the answer to that is um, it d would depend quite a bit on the inoculum dose in the water as well as the temperature um, and what species are present in the water. Um, it's possible that with a very heavy dose in the water and the conducive temperature for that species, you could get symptoms showing up very quickly in a matter of, of days or uh, a week or so. But certainly disease development could be uh, slower than that, and it is possible that the plants would not show symptoms until after uh, they're planted in consumer's yard. Second question was um, how to effectively monitor your irrigation water to know if your treatment method is working. Um, again, one method might be to use those ELISA uh, field kits. Um, that would be for Phytophthora species. Um, otherwise, the very expensive lab testing. And the last question is, um, do I see Phytophthora taxon meter hauseri uh, in, in nurseries here in Oregon, and if so, on what kinds of plants? This is not a species that has shown up here in Oregon. Um, it has been reported from North Carolina and also a number of locations in Europe, but it is not one that we see here in our greenhouses. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you have learned something from my presentation.